Welcome to Missing in Ohio, a podcast devoted to telling the stories of Ohio's missing loved ones. I am your host, Kelly Hammonds, and this is Chapter 5, The Disappearance of Amanda Ward Romine. Amanda Ward Romine is a missing adult from Springfield, Ohio. Amanda was last seen on August 9, 2013. There were many circumstances in her life leading up to her disappearance, including a failing marriage with her abusive husband. After a short separation, Amanda decided to return home and shortly after disappeared. To make things even more strange, a couple of years later, Amanda's husband died of a pre-established health condition. With the family believing Amanda's husband is responsible for her disappearance, this has made it quite difficult to find answers on what happened to her. Today I will be joined by Aaliyah, Amanda's sister. Welcome Aaliyah and thank you for joining me. Let's begin by telling me a little bit about Amanda. Um, Amanda, she was the type of person, she could light up a room. I mean, she was always very, very bubbly, um, willing to help anybody, anytime, any way she could, no matter what. Um, she always tried to bring out, like, the best in everybody. Um, she bartended a lot. She loved to bartend. She was a, a people person, you know what I'm saying? She loved to bartend, um... Trying to think what else. I mean, that was her big thing. She really bartended a lot. So she just loved the environment and she was a total people person. Well, she loved it. I mean, that was her thing. Like, she loved the crowd. You know, I don't know. That's just the type of person she was. I mean, it, she wasn't a, a stranger to anyone. What was her life like leading up to her disappearance? Um, she was actually working at, in Waynesfield. I, she moved into Indian Lake with me, um, cause her and her husband got into it again. So she came up and stayed with me. Um, and this time he, uh, the, the domestic dispute was really bad this time. And I ended up, uh, finally convincing her to follow through with charges. Um, so we, she, you know, followed through with the charges and whatnot. Um, she lived with me at Indian Lake. She got a job in Wainfield at um, a bar called Coyotes. Um, she worked there, and then she was doing really, really well. Um, then Fourth of July weekend, it was um, it was like a Thursday evening. I got off work and come home, and she's like, you know, she's like, she's like I want to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay. So we kind of went out on the porch and smoking cigarettes and talking and she said that you know she wanted to like go home for the weekend and I have three kids and just I just had that motherly feeling like not to you know what I mean like I just knew I just knew or not to go back and I'm like you know I don't think it's a good idea right now I was like why don't we just wait I was like you know if you want them to come up here have them come up here or something and hang out and I mean that was kind of like left at that well then I went to work the next day, and she ended up leaving. It was on a Friday, um, and I worked 8 to 4 that day, and she left when I was at work. Um, I don't know who picked her up because I wasn't there. And basically, my mom got really sick and got put in the hospital, and in all the midst of the confusion of all that, I was like, man, has anybody heard from Amanda? Because I have an older brother and a younger sister. And they're like, no, and they thought she was still living with me up at the lake. And I'm like, well, she went back home to her husband, you know, for the weekend, and uh, nobody had heard from her. So then I'm like, okay, this isn't right. So basically, my first stop was is I went to um, her husband's house in Springfield, you know, their house. No one was there. So then I went to his parents' house, and as soon as I got out of my car and was walking up, you have to, like, open a gate to get into their, like, front door area. I didn't even get the gate open, and his mom and my sister's husband come out, and they were like, we haven't seen her talk to Amanda. Like, they had no clue why I was even there. That was, like, the first words out of their mouth. And then I just knew something wasn't right. So I went to the police station to file a missing persons report, and it kind of, like, got shoved on the back burner because they were like, she's an adult and blah, blah, blah. So they let this go, basically, for 31 days before they took anything seriously. How long was she married to Danny? They was married a little over a year before she came up missing. How long had she been staying with you after the domestic violence? 
she has probably been with me for a good month or so. Was he charged with domestic violence? Uh, yeah, he was actually, well, he went to court in October and she come up missing in July and he was looking at uh, like two years in prison because of it. But because obviously Amanda was missing, who's going to testify? So it got dismissed and I kind of threw a fit in the courtroom because I went and I said, I want this dismissed without pre- prejudice in case, you know, something happens and she shows up, which at this point I knew, my, you know, she doesn't take off. Our mom wasn't in very good health anyway, so she didn't, you know, I mean, Amanda never would just take off anyways. She was always in contact with us. And so they dismissed it without prejudice, but, I mean, obviously nothing ever come, ever become of it because Amanda, you know, she's never been found. Did the police immediately think Danny was a suspect? Well, finally what happened was is when my mom, because we was going out looking for her, like I was up day and night looking for her. I was going on what my brother would call them dummy missions. You know, people would be like, oh, well, we've seen her here, you know, and I lived at Indian Lake, so I was a good hour away from Springfield. But I would go up there um, all the time, like looking, driving around looking for her, following these stupid leads that people would give me. Um, and then finally, after then my mom got put in the hospital and stuff, and then I kind of had to put that like on the back burner because at this point my mom's literally on her deathbed. Um, after we bury my mom and stuff, my, my dad goes down to the police station because my dad is a truck driver. So my dad finally went down there and raised all kinds of canes. Like, hey, you guys are going to start doing something because... This, you know, this isn't right. So then they finally started taking things a little bit more seriously. Um, but once we got, like, Detective Bader off the case and Sergeant Flores off the case and we got the Detective Now on the case, there's been more progress made with this Detective Now than there was with the other ones on the case. Because That's at good. one point, they searched a house next to, he owned um, Whitey's Tavern, it's a bar in Springfield, and there's a house kind of like connected to it, and they rented it out, it was upstairs, downstairs. Well, we had got uh, wind that her body was in that crawl space, and before the cops could even get a warrant to get in there and search, the body was gone, but they did find hair, skin, and skin cells in that crawl space. Did the hair or skin cells match Amanda? Yes. Did he own any other properties at the time? They owned a lot of properties, um, but now obviously he's dead. And I know like his parents own the house him and Amanda owns, um, 937 Avondale. That house right there, that's where she actually came up missing from was that house. Um, he own, His parents own that now, but they actually have did a couple digs in that house and searched it and dug up his uh, concrete and stuff in his garage and things like that. Can you tell me a little bit about Danny's death? Real bad high blood pressure. And he, they, par- I mean, him and Amanda partied a lot. I mean, they kind of lived that fast life. I mean, she didn't have kids. You know, she was a, how do you explain it? She was so free-spirited. You know what I mean? Like, she just was a risky person. Like, I don't know. I mean, Amanda did five years in prison. Amanda did her fair share of time, I mean, over drugs never been anything major um but he died of an i know his heart was like 10 times the size of what it should have been i know it was in a large heart they said um but after amanda disappeared like he basically laid drunk i mean drunk and just out of his mind on drugs like he just did not function like i mean Shelly, the detective, had had him come in there a couple times for questioning and things, and she's just like, he's just, like, not right. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't right after all this. Like, he basically stayed messed up, evidently, so he didn't have to deal with life, was was my understanding from the detective. When did police question Danny? And the first time she ever called him in for questioning, like, it took them 30 days, it took them, like, 32 days to finally call him in for questioning. Um... He lawyered up immediately. His parents did, and his brother and his brother's wife lawyered up immediately. Wow, that's really strange for the whole family to obtain attorneys. They all lawyered up. And, I mean, it's all public records. I mean, Danny has a history of domestic violence. I mean, he's got a couple charges. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
And that's all public records. I mean, his name was Daniel Romine. Do we know for certain that Amanda did make it back to Danny's house? She did. She did make it back because, how I know that, she's seen my other sister. So we know she was there. And see, Amanda never picked up her last check from her job, neither. Nor was it cashed. They ended up mailing it, I guess, and it was never cashed either. Can you tell me why Kentucky is of interest to you when it comes to Amanda's disappearance? Evidently, there was, now I'm just kind of giving you what the detective gave me. There was a gentleman that was driving to Kentucky to meet another gentleman, Danny and a couple other people. Um, a bag full of, of, like, drugs. Supposedly, he drove it to Kentucky, swapped it off to give it to the other guy, and he said in the midst of swapping, he realized it was a body and was pretty sure it was Amanda's. Um, they, this guy was already in jail on another charge that told all this, so they drug him out of jail. He gave, he took them the same route he went. They drove him down there. Showed, he showed them where the drop all, you know, where they met up, swapped out, all that jazz. Um, and they did some digging down there. Uh, then late, later on, uh, the guy had tried to say what he said was a lie. It wasn't true. So at this point, he had wasted a lot of time, energy, and tax money as far as whatnot. So the judge kind of slapped uh, two years on him for uh, uh, basically lying about the situation. And when I spoke with the detective about it, she said, I don't think it was all a lie. She said, I believe some of it was the truth. She said, but trying to find that truth. And I mean, the stories we hear is that she's either, she's been put through a wood chipper, she's in Kentucky, or she's like in the bottom of C.J. Brown Reservoir, or she's in the bottom of Indian Lake. Like, them are the nonstop, like, stories, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. that we get. They're, they're pretty consistent. Have any of those bodies of water been searched? They have not. Um, and this is this is going to be my idea that I'm going to present with the detective. Um, I'm going to get a hold of her this week, actually, because uh, I've kind of let them do their thing, and you know what I mean, and not interfered, not bothered them. And the detective, like I said, that's on the case now is very. I mean, Amanda's case started out with one black binder. Now there's like 13 black binders. Like there's boxes, you know what I'm saying, and evidence, and like there's a lot of stuff now. Um, she actually has an analyst on the case. Also, um, and I, when I told you um, and over the messages, I just had to take a laptop down like three weeks ago um, that Amanda had used at my house to get on her Facebook and things. But Amanda deactivated her Facebook before she left to go back because he didn't like the fact that she had a Facebook, so she deactivated it. Well, she used that laptop that I had, so I took that down to them to see if they could get in there and get anything out of it as far as messenger and things like that. Um, but we do, uh, te- we we are in touch with Texas EquiSearch, uh, Dave Radar. Um, he is willing to bring up his sonar equipment and go through bodies of water, but uh, at no cost to the family. I mean, um, but he has to kind of be like invited by the detectives, like, He's like, since it's an open case, he's like, I can't physically just come up there and start looking. He's like, I really need the detectives to invite me up. So at first, everybody was like, no, no, no. Um, and now that, you know what I mean, I've let things go and let them handle it their way, I'm basically going to be like, you know, let's try my way. Why don't we get him up here and let him search some of these bodies of water? You don't believe there is any way possible that Amanda would have just walked away? No, not at all. Did he have any connections to law enforcement? His brother is a bounty hunter. Okay. And yes, he had, um, I know the Urbana police and some of the commissioners of Urbana, and I know this for a personal fact because I've witnessed it. Um, he sold them coke, um, so, and 
I know there were some Springfield officers that had also, and I made that very point blank to the detectives, and I also gave them names, um, and they are still investigating things. You know what I mean? Like, it's still an ongoing investigation um, as far as some of them cops, they that family has in their back pocket. Okay. And that is why I think it took a little while for things to get moving. Did his parents or brother ever give a reason as to why they got an attorney? Nope, but see, here's the thing. They're the type of family. They're very close-knit. So, and Danny was their baby boy. So, whatever Danny did, I can guarantee you my, I can guarantee you on my life and my children's life, that's how sure I am. Dave Romine knows and helped bail him out, I'm sure, and his parents know and helped bail him out. Because there is actually uh, Big Dan, Danny's dad, Big Daniel Romine, actually has a domestic violence case against Amanda. He went to jail for beating the shit out of my sister. Danny's dad beat Amanda? Yes. Wow, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, because they're... The easiest way to describe this family is is they all like to drink and party, and that's fine. You know, that's fine. I don't care what you do. I don't care. I mean, like I said, my sister lived a fast life. I mean, she wasn't no big old junkie or drug head, nothing like that. She worked. I mean, she used to strip. You know what I'm saying? Like, she was just very outgoing, and she just lived that life. And you know what? She could because she didn't have kids. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She did want kids, but she wanted to enjoy her life a little bit. Um, but his family, they're all drinkers, and when they drink, they all like to get mouthy. Well, my sister was a type. She didn't take no shit off of nobody, period. And that's kind of, you know what I'm saying? That's how it ended up. Did his dad get charged for domestic violence for beating Amanda? Uh, I believe so. Has any of his family ever participated in searches or vigils? No visuals, no nothing. Nope. And uh, Shelly, the last visual we did when Danny was alive, Shelly tried to get Danny to come, and she's like, I'll be there. So you ain't nobody, you know, no one will mess with you or anything. She's like, I'll be there. He still wouldn't come. So you definitely think someone else knows something. I do. I do. I mean, and like I told the detective, in a crazy, crazy stupid way, because she asked me when she first interviewed me, you know, what did I think happened? And I said, you know, I think maybe her and Danny got into it and it just went a little far and he hurt her real bad this time. And in a crazy, stupid way, them two loved each other. They did. He loved her. I will not deny that. He loved her. Danny was the type of person, and it took me a little bit to even think of this scenario and to, like, explain it, but with the detective, like I told her, I said, Danny was the type of person that, as long as he knew where Amanda was at, he was content, okay? So, yes, I know when Amanda came up missing, he knew exactly where her body was at all times because in a sick way, in his mind, he was content because he knew where she was at. Does that make sense? Her, like when she would avoid his phone calls and he didn't know where she was at, he would blow my phone up nonstop <laughs> trying to find her, trying to figure out something or whatever. Like, And he never did that this time. So that's how I knew he knew where she is at and what happened. And in his sick mind, he was content with that because he knew exactly where her dead body was. You know, he knew where she was at. So he was content with that because he knew. Can you tell me about some of the events that you have done for Amanda? Every year, we do it twice a year. We do it usually around Christmas time. Sometimes we do it um, on her birthday. It just depends. Because um, like I said, my dad was a truck driver. So he would at least try to get to one of them. So it just depended. Um, and we always did one around the time she come up missing. And every year they get smaller and smaller and smaller. But, you know, I don't care if I'm the only one there releasing a balloon. I don't care. She's still missing, and I want people to know that. And I'm going to keep her name out there. Um, and that's why we do it, to let people know she's still missing. You know, and no information is too small. But this has changed my life. I can't tell you what sleep is like anymore, and I'm not kidding. I'm lucky if I get two or three hours of broken up sleep 
every night. And it's been like this for five years because I lay in bed and I think. And when I think, then I just branch off to something else. Then I branch off to this. And and it's always, you know, she's the last thing I think about, the first thing I think, you know, think about when I open my eyes. She was my best friend. Like that was just that she wasn't just my sister. I mean, that was my best friend. That was my go-to when things got hard, that's who I called. That's who I talked to. I mean, now it's like I have, I mean, I don't have any, you know, I just feel like I'm alone. Like I don't have anybody. That's how I feel. You told me you have some very vivid dreams about Amanda. Would you mind sharing that with us? It's always the same dream, though. It's like it's always the same dream. She's, um, we're always in the, I mean, I don't know. If you Google, like, C.J. Brown Reservoir in Springfield, like basically it's a big reservoir and I mean there's trees and picnic areas around like there's not anything it all looks the same if that makes sense and it's like in this dream she's in grass she's standing in grass and she's in a white t-shirt and she's not she just has this straight face on her and she just stands there and looks at me and it's always there's a bunch of trees around everything looks the same and it's like when I have this dream, it's like I always try to look around as fast as I can. I look at anything, everything, as fast as I possibly can, and, like, just to try to get an area. Like, where are you at? Like, you know, a, a, a landmark, something. And it's like I never can get a landmark, ever. I don't know. It's so weird. Did Amanda ever go to the reservoir? No, but, I mean, it's. A pretty there's some pretty secluded areas in there like if you wanted to get in there and put a body in there it wouldn't be hard to get away with you know what I'm saying like mm-hmm. I mean if you google mapped it you would see what I mean I mean there's little in and outs and things like that um and there's a big old floodgate uh that open up also um and I think that goes to the I think I'm gonna say like the Miami River maybe I'm not sure. I know there's big old floodgates, too, because somebody has said they checked around the floodgates and all this and that. And, I mean, at one point, Danny had a boat, you know. Is there anything you would like listeners to know about the case or Amanda? I mean, that nothing's too small at all. You know, any information needs to be, you know, they can, the uh, Springfield Police Department has an anonymous tip line, and the detective on the case, I mean, she is very, very good as far as, doing things anonymously, talking to people, and also, like, she always stresses to us, I don't care if they have little warrants. She said, I'm willing to work with people. You know, her philosophy is you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You give us good, you know, good leads, good things, you know, I can make things disappear. Okay. So there's been people that's called in that's, you know, had little stupid warrants, and, you know, Shelly's like, I, you're not, I'm not going to arrest you because you're coming and talking to me. I don't care about your warrants. You know, you, you help me, I'll help you. What would you say to the person that caused harm to your sister? I mean, I would probably say, you know, I'm not mad at them. And I'm not. I mean, I don't care what they did. I just want to know where her remains are. You know, I mean, I, I forgive them. I don't care. You know, just give our family the peace that we deserve. I mean, they've done took a, a big part of our life away. And I feel like, you know, we just deserve that little bit of closure. Do you have any advice for other families with missing loved ones? All I can say is, you know, don't ever forget to stop and pray. Don't ever forget to look at the sky. You know, don't forget to live. Don't forget to breathe. You know, just keep their name out there is all you can do. I mean, and you've got to keep pushing forward. I mean, if not, you know, you're going to kill yourself, you know, you have to, I mean, like, I, I mean, I'm at work all day. I mean, I try to put my sister to the back of my head because I'm a nurse, but always talk about them, you know, don't let people forget. I mean, like at dinners and things like that, when we have dinners, you know, we always talk about Amanda, you know, the fun things. I mean, we still talk as if she's still alive. I mean, and it's okay to, you know, it's okay to be sad. It's okay, it's okay to, you know, to be upset. I mean, it's okay to, you know, have your moments. That's completely fine. I mean, I have moments all of the time. I mean, but you also, you know, I still have a family. 
you know, I can't be sad all the time. I mean, because if I'm sad, then it makes my family sad. I don't want to hurt my family anymore. I would like to thank Aaliyah for taking the time to speak with me today and sharing Amanda's story. And now here's a summary of the case. Amanda Ward Romine was a free spirit that loved life, her family, and being around people. Despite getting married about a year before she went missing, Amanda was dealing with an abusive relationship with an abusive family. Not only was she abused by her husband, she was also abused by her father-in-law. In June, Amanda decided she had had enough after more domestic violence at the hands of her husband. She left her husband and went to live with her sister, Aaliyah. Almost a month later, she decided to go back and make things work with her husband. She went missing shortly after. Once law enforcement got involved, Danny and his family began showing strange behavior. Not only did Danny become a drunk borderline hermit, but he also obtained an attorney. In an even bigger twist, Danny's parents and brother obtained the same attorney. That on its own leaves me with so many questions. What do they know about Amanda's disappearance? Why would the entire family get an attorney? In another twist of fate, Danny suddenly passed away of a pre-existing health condition, leaving Amanda's family nervous that they may never find answers. What was originally thought by police that Amanda was a missing person quickly changed to a homicide without a body. The reason for the belief being the discovery of human hair and skin cells belonging to Amanda in the crawl space of a property owned by the Romine family. Danny's death may have been a roadblock in finding answers for Amanda, but I firmly believe this case is solvable. It is my opinion that Danny's family knows something on the disappearance of Amanda Ward Romine. It's time for someone to come forward and bring answers to the Ward family. You can find more information about Amanda and follow her disappearance on Facebook on the Amanda Ward Romine Facebook page. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, please contact the Ohio Domestic Violence Network at 1-800-934-9840. There is help out there. Missing in Ohio is an affiliate of Missing Person from Ohio, a Facebook page ran by Lori Davis. Here's a message from Lori on how Missing Person from Ohio can help you if you have a missing loved one. Missing Person from Ohio is an outlet for those with missing loved ones where we can publicize their case. I can help ensure that they are listed on the correct organizations. I can talk to the family members about steps that they can take to try to help keep the publicity out there for their missing loved one. And I can also just work with that family to let them understand that someone cares, that we are a group of individuals that really want to help and we're doing this for the right reasons. Um, we're doing everything that we can to help them bring their missing loved one home. And if we're not able to bring them home, we can at least help support them during the time while they're missing. Missing in Ohio can be found on Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, and many of the other platforms you enjoy. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at missingpersonsinohio at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Chapter 5, The Disappearance of Amanda Ward Romine. Tune in next time for Missing in Ohio, Chapter 6.